Thank you for taking the time to listen to today's message. We hope that it blesses and encourages you. Have a great day. Of Jesus, we thank you this morning, God, for your grace and your mercy. We thank you that your grace is sufficient and that your mercy is anew this morning, God. Father in heaven, we pray, God, that your grace will be upon your people, God, to receive your word this morning. Father in heaven, we come against the distractions of this day. We come against right now every voice, God, every voice of opposition, everything that would try to take our attention off of you and off your throne. Father, we pray, God, that your word will penetrate every single heart this morning, God. We pray in the name of Jesus, God, that none of us will walk out of this place, God, the same way we walked in this morning. We pray let there be a transformation, a renewing, in our spirit this morning, God. And Father, I pray that you would use me to speak your word with boldness and passion and accuracy this morning, God. Father in heaven, let your word go forward, God, to change lives. Father, we love you and we thank you. We give you all the praise, honor, and all the glory this morning, God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we worship him one more time? <laughs> Hallelujah! <laughs> amen. You can find your seat. Listen, you know why we worship God? Because he's worthy to be worshipped. Amen. Some things are not worthy of my worship, but God is. Amen. Hallelujah. So we want to minister to you this morning in a message that I've called the Valley of Blessing. The Valley of Blessing. Uh, The Valley of Blessing. You know, whenever we face issues in life, and who's ever been through issues in life? Come on, everybody. Everybody. Kids are raising their hand. I got some issues, Pastor. So whenever we face issues, severe crises in our life, There's two ways that we can approach it. Either we look for a way of escaping the very things we're going through, all right? And that's that's usually the thing we want to do the most. Let me get out of here. Or we find the inner strength and knowledge to be able to conquer the things that we're going through. But if we can be honest and real this morning, most times we don't have a way of escape. Even though we want to, there's no way out. And if we can be honest, we don't have a clue on how to deal with the issues that are going on in our life. And it's at these moments, more than ever, that we need the help of someone who has the power and the resources to deliver us from the very things we're going through. The crises that we're going through may be due to an accident, illness, death, a criminal act, things going on at work, amen, or some failure on our part. But no matter what the crisis is or challenges that we're facing this morning, I got some good news for you. There's someone who has the power to deliver us. There's someone, amen, who can make a way where there seems to be no way. And that someone this morning is Jesus Christ. When we don't feel like we got it together, he does. We don't feel like we can make it, he will cause us to make it. When we don't feel like I can get through what I'm getting through, God says, yes, you can. And today, we're going to get an amazing picture of God's power when we're surrounded by the enemy. When we're surrounded by calamity, surrounded by crises in our life, we're going to get a clear picture of how God shows up and shows out when we need him the most. Amen? The text we're going to be reading this morning, it involves a king by the name of King Jehoshaphat. Best name in the Bible. King Jehoshaphat. And King Jehoshaphat was, you know, when you look at the Bible, and especially when you're looking at, you know, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st Chronicles, 2nd Chronicles, you go through and you begin to see a lot of kings, and the Bible describes this king that was evil in the sight of the Lord. And over and over, this king did. He was worse than his father. They were worse. But King Jehoshaphat was one of the rare kings who did what was right before the Lord. You know, and, and that's the thing, man. You know, when we, we go through life and say, man, God, I'm doing everything right, but then everything goes wrong. That sometimes that happens. And it's not because God's mad at you, punishing you. He's just refining you through the fire. Amen? So King Jehoshaphat is one of these kings who loved God, lived for God. His father, King Asa, did the same thing. He learned from his father to serve God and do the right thing. And and here he is. He's serving God. And and as he's serving and he's leading the people, the Bible describes that he had years of peace in his life. You know, let me tell you something real quick. Don't let years of peace lull you into a false sense of security. Only one person understand that? (laughs) What I mean is this, because we've had everything go so good so long, we don't pray the way we should. We think, I'm good, I don't never have problems. But then when those problems come, you don't know how to deal with it. Why? Because you've been lulled to sleep by how everything's been going right in your life, amen? So don't let years of peace Take your focus off the king of kings and the lord of lords. Amen? So, so it talks about these years of peace that he had. And then all of a sudden, literally, a crisis 
and calamity invade his life. The text we're going to be reading out of this morning is found in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, starting with verse 1. So if you have your Bible, read along with me, or Chris will put it up here for us. But the Bible talks about this. So it opens up in the New Living Translation, and in verse 1 of chapter 20, it says that after this, stop right there, I love reading Bible in context. We don't just read one thing and we live our life off that one thing. So when it says after this, my, my main question, after what? So I want you to get a full picture. So when he says after this, it's speaking of the times in King Jehoshaphat's life when he did things to pull people back into the kingdom of God. The Bible said that he lived in Jerusalem, but he went into all the places, each from the hill countries, and he began to pull people back, people who have fallen away from God, didn't worship God. And he's literally coming and pulling them back to the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He's doing all these things, setting up things, setting up Levites and priests, people who can minister to other people. He's doing these things because people in the past didn't. So he's doing all these things, doing the right thing amen so then it says after this after doing all these things he's done it says the armies of the Moabites Ammonites and some of the Meunites declared war on Jehoshaphat so whether you know it or not and whether you believe it or not church the moment you said no to your old nature the moment you said no to your old life and you said yes to God is the moment you made an enemy That's the moment that the enemy of your soul declared war on you. See, listen, the enemy was not mad at you when you were getting drunk. The enemy was not mad at you when you were getting high. The enemy was not mad when you were doing all the things you shouldn't have been doing. But the moment you said yes to him and no to the old nature and the old you is the moment you created the enemy out of the enemy of your soul. So what it makes me understand is this Christianity is more than just going to church. It's more than, you would think, well, yeah, I'm saved. Why? Because I went to church. That don't mean nothing. That don't mean anything just because you go to church. See, listen, Christianity is more than church attendance on a Sunday morning. Christianity, listen, I know some of you ain't going to like this, but Christianity is a thing called warfare. I know, I know. You went to a church and they said, you know, peace and love and, and all these other things. Listen, it's real. And the moment, listen, the quicker you understand that, the quicker you can overcome. Come on, listen, the enemy that I know don't play fair. He's trying to get you back. He's trying to get you to trip up, to go back to your old nature and old life. Listen, this is warfare. Christianity is literally this. I made a line in the sand. I picked a side. I'm going to serve God, amen? It's literally a battle between the good and evil of this world. Make no mistake about it. It's warfare. And Christianity, listen, when we talk about warfare, the warfare that I'm talking about is not against each other. Let me point that out, amen? Listen, I know some of you might, oh, that that person has spirit. I'm mad. No, 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 listen. It's not against one another. Paul made it clear in Ephesians, we don't battle against flesh and blood. Meaning my battle is not with you. I love you. You love me, right? All right, come on now. Like, maybe, I don't know. It depends on how this is going. Listen, well, listen. our battle is not against one another. You know what that means, husband? Your battle is not against your wife. Pastor, her head spinning around. No, 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 stop. <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> wife, your husband's not the enemy. Your kids are not your enemy. They don't listen. Whatever, they're not listening. What you have to understand is this. We, we deal with people, but you also have to be mature enough in your faith. If you're serving God any length of time, you've got to be mature enough to understand that my battle is not against you, but maybe the spirit that's behind your actions is what I need to battle with. So listen, my battle may not be with you because you're mad all the time, but I'm going to fight against that spirit called anger. Or you know, I say I'm trying to give you an example. You know, it, it, it's not you. It's whatever the spirit behind that is causing these actions in your life is the very things that I'm attacking and fighting and warring against my prayer time. Are you with me? So we battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, hosts of wickedness in high places. Amen. Listen, the enemy, the devil, is called the prince of the air, the prince of this world. So that's who our battle is against, amen? And the the goal of the enemy is to attempt to get us who follow God to fall back to who we used to be. When we allow the enemy to cause us to go backwards instead of moving forwards, you know what happens? He's trying to make us ruin our testimony. And what I mean by that is this. 
when the enemy can get us to go backwards, what we're doing is this. We're diminishing the power of the cross to save. We're diminishing the power of what Jesus did to set us free in the first place. We're diminishing his power because once we walked into freedom, we need to stay in freedom. We don't need to go back. Will we, will we fall short? Will we mess up sometimes? Yeah, but that don't mean you have to live in that place. If I fall, I'm not going to stay there and lay down. If I fall, I'm going to get back up and keep going. Amen? See, me falling may make it harder to go forward, but i got to keep going forward. I can't go backwards, and that's what the enemy wants us to do. Listen, I have to make a decision. I want to be more. I want to do more. I want to serve God. I want to be the man of God he created me to be and envision in his heart years before I was even born. So that's to be the goal of every person. We, we believe in this church that this is a year of more. This is a year of more. So listen, I can believe that this is my year of more and then do less. I can't believe this is my year of more and don't do nothing. I have to progress forward because if I'm not progressing, I'm regressing. Are you with me? So we have to believe that God, who did you envision me to be? The Bible talks about it. Listen, he knew us before we were formed in our mother's womb. And he knew the plan that he had for us and what he desired for us to be. But I like to tell people this. God has a plan for our life, but so does the devil. His plan is to kill, steal, and destroy. God says, I've come to give life and life more abundantly. I want to walk in the abundant life that God has for me. Amen? Amen. So our text says in verse 2, it says, The messengers came and told Jehoshaphat, A vast army from Edom is marching against you from beyond the Dead Sea. They are already at Hazazon Tamar. Jehoshaphat was terrified by this news and begged the Lord for guidance. He also ordered everyone in Judah to begin fasting. Listen, the worst thing to do is to pretend you're too super spiritual to ever be shaken by anything. You know, you know what it's like? It's like when you, you come home and your kids jump out, ah, and they scare you. It's like this. You can say, ah, and you're like, no, I'm scared. You didn't scare me. I'm cool. I'm cool. No, you got scared. He just too prideful to tell your son, yeah, you got me. And sometimes, listen, we can be shaken by things, and it's okay. Listen, who are you? We're not Jesus. It's okay to admit, man, that is shaking me. This is terrifying me. You know, listen, I, I don't know what to do. It's okay because the moment that he was faced with this news, the Bible says that he was terrified by it. See, there are things that can happen that can shake us to our core, to our very being. Things that can terrify us. And it's never a matter of if you're scared, if you're terrified. You will get scared of things. Listen, I understand, you know, don't be religious. God is not giving me a spirit of uh, fear. Yeah, he didn't give it to you, but you still get scared. I didn't say it was God's fault. But I'm telling you that there's times in our life that we're shaken. That we're frightened by things. You know, and it's, it's not about if, but when. And when I'm shaken by something, it's all about this. How do I respond when I'm shaken? How do I respond when I'm terrified? How do I respond when things don't go right in my life? Because listen, here's the truth. Where there is an action, there's always a what? Reaction. All right, look at y'all. When there's an action, there's a reaction. When this news came to King Joseph, that it shook him. It caused great fear to come upon his life. But the first thing he did when there was the action, his reaction was this. I'm going before the Lord. I'm going to pray. I'm going to seek his face. I got to get a hold of the king, amen. Listen, he begged the Lord, give me guidance. Show me what to do. And he knew the second best thing to do was this, start fasting. Start getting a hold of God, amen? Not only for myself, but everyone around us, amen? We need to fast. We need, we need to understand that there's something that's coming after us. Can I tell you something? When we're affected by anything, please catch me. Catch me on this. When we're affected by anything, guess what? It is not only you who will be affected by what's affecting you. When you're affected by something, it will affect those who are around you. When you go through things, if people love you enough, they go through it with you. I, when I'm affected by something, my wife's affected by something. When she's affected by something, I'm affected by something. It's not just something we go through in isolation and alone. When we're affected, as long as there's people around us, everyone around us is affected by what we're affected by. Mm. Come on, somebody. So when he said, let's fast, let's pray, he didn't do it just because he was scared. He knew that there's a people that I'm leading, people that I love, people I'm responsible for that need to know that there's something happening and we need to get a hold of God. So the Bible says in verse 4, so people from all the towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. 
Jehoshaphat stood before the community of Judah and Jerusalem in front of the new courtyard of the temple of the Lord. He prayed, O Lord, God of our ancestors, you alone are the God who is in heaven. You are ruler of all the kingdoms of the earth. You are powerful and mighty. No one can stand against you. Oh, our God, did you not drive out those who lived in this land when your people Israel arrived? And did you not give this land forever to the descendants of your friend Abraham? I love this. You know why? Because he began to declare who God is. When you go through something, why don't you tell God who he is? I know he knows, but you need to know. Declare who God is, how mighty he is, how strong he is. And then after he began to re- tell him who he is, he began to remind him of what he's capable of. He said, did you not drive them out? Did you not give us this land? You know, me and my wife were in a pastor meeting yesterday, and we saw this video. I actually showed it to the leaders this morning. But, but uh, when the, the guy was speaking said something so powerful. He said, talk more about what God has done, more than what he's able to do. Now, why, why do we do that? So when we talk more about what he's already done, we are reminded of all the amazing things God has done in life. You know what it does? It builds up our confidence. So when I'm talking more about what he's done, more than what he's about to do or what he's capable of doing, what I'm saying is, God, I know you can do it because you did it. Uh, let me tell you something, God. You, you, you saved me. You set me free. You delivered me when no one said they could. You, 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 you broke the, uh, the addictions and the bondages off of my life. Amen? You restored my marriage. You saved my soul. You did this to my children. You showed up and showed out when I need. Listen, I'm telling God what he's done because it builds up my confidence of what he can do. Come on, somebody. Daily, whether we're facing obstacles and invasions or not, and even when we're not facing obstacles or invasions, we should tell God how good he is. Declare his power over your life, over your family, over your marriage, over your children, over your finances, over your health, over every area. Listen, if, if it means enough to you, declare God's word over it. After that, start reminding God of every time he brought a victory to your life. Because if he did it then, he can do it again and again and again. Because there's no, listen, there's no limit to the power of God. There's no limit. I, I, you know, people are like, well, I'm not going to pray about this because I want him to answer that one. No, you can pray. No, you can pray about everything all the time. He, he's, not, he's not your cell phone. I know you charge it overnight, but then at 4 o'clock it's like red. At least that's how my phone is. But God's not like that. Listen, he starts off at 100% in the morning. He's still at 100% in the afternoon. He's still at 100% at 4 o'clock. He's still at 100% at 8 o'clock. When you sleep, he's still fully charged. His power never runs out. He says in verse 8, he says, your people, still talking to God, settled here and built this temple to honor your name. They said whenever. Somebody say whenever. Not if. Whenever we are faced with any calamity, such as war, plague, or famine, we can come and stand in your presence before this temple where your name is honored. We can cry out to you to save us, and you will hear us and rescue us. You know what I get out of this? King Jehoshaphat is stating faith. It's a statement of faith, a statement of truth. He's declaring what God will do. He's he's declaring. He's not not saying if or can you, maybe, what if. He's saying you will do these things because I know who you are. Amen? So he says this, and he says, whenever, whenever we are faced with any calamity, We know where to go. When things go on in our life, when people go through things, for some odd reason, people pull back instead of press forward. It's weird. Because, you know, I've been saved a good long time, and I've been through ups and downs. I've been through through moments in my life where I didn't want to go to church. But I did. Because it's not about what I felt. It's about what I needed to do, amen, to get me through the storm in life. And, you know, for some reason, when we go through things, we don't see people. Come on, can I tell the truth this morning? When, when, we, when people go through things, that's how we know they're going through things because they ain't here. Hey, what's going on? And we, then we know, hey, something's going on in life. But listen, when you go through things, that is not the moment to pull back. 
That is not the moment to give up and quit and say, I, I can't do this, it's too hard. Listen, I know you may not feel like coming to church in the morning because of all the hell going on around you, but we go because that's my place of refuge. That, that's where I go, amen. I'm going to feel the presence of God. I mean, come on. I, I don't want people to ask me what's going on. Who cares? Stop being prideful. It don't matter. If, listen, if somebody asks you what's going on, it ain't because they know it. They got their own issues. If somebody asks you what's going on because they love you enough to find out what's going on in your life and to be there for you, to help you, to be a blessing in your life. But that, that's what we do. We let the enemy lie to say, oh, they're just being nosy. No, they're not being nosy. Do you know the hell they're going through in life? They don't need to take your own extra stuff going on in life, but they do it because they care about you. They want to know what's up. They want to know how to pray for you. So listen, when you go through things in life, just like King Jehoshaphat, he went to the temple of the Lord. He did not pull back. He pressed in. So can I tell you something this morning? Don't pull back when you go through things. Press in when you go through things. It says in verse 10, And now, still talking to God, see what the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir are doing. You would not let our ancestors invade those nations when Israel left Egypt. So they ran around them and did not destroy them. Now, see how they reward us. For they have come to throw us out of the land which you gave us as an inheritance. This, this, really, this alone could be a whole other message. He's saying that we had an encounter with these same people who were trying to take us out. And in reality, we could have took them out a long time ago. You told us, God, to go around them and not through them. We could have went through them, and by your power and strength, we could have took them out like we did other people. But you advised us to go around us. So now that we spared them, now they want to come after us. God, what's up? They're coming for us, and we did nothing but good to them. So this is where the whole other message can come. There are times when we do the right thing, and we can feel like we're being repaid with evil. Let that get into somebody right now. You ever feel like that, and I'm doing everything the right way, and I'm still going through things? I'm doing everything the right way, and I feel like I'm being repaid with evil? Listen, this is where Christianity really comes in. So when we feel like we did the right thing, come on, come on somebody, we did the right thing, we're being repaid with evil in our flesh. We say, all right, bet. I got you. See if I do that again. Come on, be real. Oh, it was like that. It's like that? All right, bet. Watch. You don't win back 20 years. You're like, all right, bet. I got you. What? what? You're picking fights with people. Listen. <laughs> I love my church. Amen. But when, when, when we feel like that, the Bible still says that we do not repay evil. We don't. When evil is done to us, we don't repay evil. We repay evil with good. Oh, that, you know what? that's why I say this is where Christianity happens. Because Christianity is hard. It's countercultural. It goes against what you want to do. You want to get back at people. That person and, you know, flipped you off on the highway. You know what you want to do. You want to chase them down. <laughs> you just did. You want to chase them down. <laughs> you, want, you want to go off. But listen, how many times have we took the humble approach? Listen, I, I'll be honest with you this morning. I haven't always been the best with road issues. Okay? But I've learned that when I get cut off, when somebody does something dumb, I just don't react no more. I just don't. It's not because, oh, I'm that good now. I just had to learn, you know what? If I do what someone else has done, how different am I really? I don't want to do what everyone else is doing. I, I, want, to, I want to be different. I want to be the light of the world. I don't want to be dim like everyone else is. Even though in my flesh I may feel like doing it, and I may squint my eyes, I'm not going to do nothing dumb no more. I'm just going to, you know what, whatever. Because is it that big of a deal? I've seen people get in a road rage, and they, they pulling out guns and shooting each other right now over, over road issues. I want to go home to my family. <laughs> I don't want to prove a point. 
Come on, somebody. But in natural reactions, we want to react to the flesh. But God is calling us no longer to react in our flesh, but by the spirit. Right? So just because someone does evil does not mean you must repay them with more evil. Listen, what if that's the only way they get saved? Because I responded by being good, doing good. I responded the God way instead of my way. And now they see the Christ is really living in me. Amen? Come on, somebody. He says in verse 12, Oh, our God, won't you stop them? We are powerless against this mighty army that is about to attack us. We do not know what to do. Anybody ever said that? I don't know what to do. But we are looking to you for help. Come on, have you ever felt powerless? Ever felt weak against a situation, look like a mountain before you? Listen, there is nothing wrong with admitting, I don't know what to do. There's nothing wrong with getting counsel and help, amen. There's nothing wrong with admitting, I'm powerless against this. Because the moment you can admit to God that I'm weak, I'm powerless, I don't know what to do, is a moment that is power because manifest in your life. I preached about this a little while ago when Paul was saying, listen, I'm weak. But God's strength is made greater in my weakness. It takes a humble spirit to confess, I'm weak. Your weakness is a God, but listen, but be of good cheer. Because God's word declares that he gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. I can admit to you, Lord, I don't know what to do. I can admit I'm weak in this area. I can admit I don't know how to do this. So how am I going to overcome this? I need the strength of God, not the strength of Lewis. Because the strength of Lewis ain't good enough. It says in verse 13 that as all the men of Judah stood before the Lord, their little ones, wives, and children, the Spirit of the Lord came upon one of the men standing there. His name was Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, son of Benaiah, son of Jael, son of Mataniah, a Levite who was a descendant of Asaph. Let me, let me paint this for you. King Jehoshaphat prays to God. All the people standing around in complete silence, waiting on an answer from God. When the Lord speaks not to Jehoshaphat, but to a man who was a Levite, a priest set apart, he spoke to this man. And he said, listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem, listen, King Jehoshaphat, this is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. The battle is not yours, it's God's. You didn't get it. The battle is not yours, it's God's. You still ain't catching it. The battle is not yours, it's God's. The battle is not mine, it's God's. The battle is not yours, it's God's. The battle is not yours, it's God's. Some of you have been through so much in this season of your life. Some of you are going through so much today. It seems like the seasons we're in will never be over, that it will last forever, and today you need to declare this over your life. The battle is not mine, it's God's. You know what this does for you? Listen, I can, I, you know, I like to visualize. If I was sitting there with King Jehoshaphat and this Levite and all the people, and he's sitting there, almost sitting silent and waiting to hear from the Lord, I got it. Everybody quiet down. I got it. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army. The Lord says the battle is not yours. It's his. If we really trust and faith in God, you know what the attitude would have been for all these people standing there in the temple waiting to hear from God? It would have been this. <sighs> Man, that's great. Because you know what? It should have brought a sense of relief to those who heard it. Do you know what happens when you understand the battle is not yours but God's? You know what it does? It takes pressure off of you and on the God. That means, listen, I, I'm cool. I, I'm not full of pressure because because no longer do I feel like I got to do this myself. No longer do I feel like I got to overcome this giant myself. No longer do I need to think that I got to do everything myself. This is not on me no more. When I understand the battle is not mine, but it's God's, I have relief because I no longer feel the pressure of having to do these things myself. The battle is not mine's, it's God's. 
What battles are you going through right now? Think about it for just a minute. What battles are you going through in your relationships? What battles are you going through in your marriage? What battles are you going through, amen, in just your, your finances, your health? Maybe you've been sick in body. Maybe you know somebody in your family close you sick in body. What battles are you going through right now? And whatever those battles are, I want to tell you something. The battle is not yours. It's God's. For you who believe that, you should walk out of church this morning with a sense of relief that I don't have to do it by myself. For those of us who really ain't catching or buying into it, you still feel the pressure. You still feel the weight of the world on your shoulders. But they, listen, your shoulders are not built for the weight for the world. It's not. I know, come on, man, I know you feel like I got to carry all this. It's not meant for you to carry all this. Because the battle is not yours, it's God's. Let that bring some relief to your life, Amen. And this point is confirmed in verse 16 and 17. It says, tomorrow, march out against them. You will find them coming up to the ascent of Ziz at the end of the valley that opens into the wilderness of Jeriel, but you will not even need to fight. Listen, there's points in the Bible where they did fight. They went with the strength of the Lord, and they fought and they overcome. He said, listen, this battle was so much mine and not yours, you don't even need to fight. Come on, do, do I need to put my boxing gloves up? Nope, you don't need to do all that. Do I need to exercise? You don't need to do nothing. Because, listen, the battle is not yours, it's mine. And I mean that literally. I am going to go and fight this battle for you. You won't even need to fight. I know some of you are like, oh, I like fighting. You like fighting people. You need to chill. You need to, listen, we're talking about a spiritual. Don't you love that? Have you ever stopped to think that the reason these things seem so overwhelming in our lives is because we're always trying to be the ones fighting? See, when you are fighting something that <laughs> you have no way of destroying yourself, you will feel overwhelmed. You will get up daily feeling beat up and wore out. But that's because you've been trying to do it instead of letting God do it for you. He says, take your positions, then stand still. You know what the Bible says? Be still and know that I am God. Stand still and watch the Lord's victory. He is with you. O people of Judah and Jerusalem, don't be afraid or discouraged. Go out against them tomorrow, for the Lord is with you. Then King Jehoshaphat bowed low with his face to the ground. And all the people of Judah and Jerusalem did the same, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites from the clans of Kohath and Korah stood to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud shout. Listen, can you praise God before the victory? Now, oh, come on, somebody. Can you praise him even though the victory is not there yet? Come on, that, that's what you, when you praise, you're opening the door to the victory to happen. I ain't going to wait till after it happens to give God praise. Let's give God praise in the midst of what we're going through. Amen? And it says, early on the next morning, verse 20, the army of Judah went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. On the way, Jehoshaphat stopped and said, listen to me, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in his prophets, and you will succeed. After consulting the people, the king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising him from his holy splendor. This is what they sang. Give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. At that very moment, verse 22, they begin to sing and give praise. The Lord calls the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start fighting among themselves. <laughs> Listen, there is power in the praise that God has placed in your mouth. There's power in your praise. Listen, I don't, listen, I'm not getting on to nobody, but I don't understand how we come to church and don't praise. How we come to this altar and put our hands in our pocket and look around everybody else. Listen, this is my moment that I can get my breakthrough. This is the moment, amen, that I can get my freedom. There is power and the praise that God has placed in your mouth. And let me tell you something. When you begin to praise like you really need to be praising, your praise will cause confusion to the enemy. Your praise will bring confusion. Listen, I know the enemy is set out to hurt you, to steal from you, to kill you, to destroy you. But the moment you begin to release a praise, then listen, the plans of the enemy fall back on itself. The enemy came out to attack you. But then something happened. You started praising. You started worshiping. 
you start to listen up the name of Jesus. You start to worship like never before. In the midst of your pain, you listen up your praise. And the moment you start praising, the enemy that was set out for you turn and start fighting with one another. Some of y'all wish you would catch it. Your praise has the ability to bring confusion to the enemy. The armies of Moab and Ammon turned against their allies from Mount Seir and killed every one of them. After they destroyed the army of Seir, they began attacking each other. So when the army of Judah arrived at the lookout point in the wilderness, all they saw were dead bodies laying on the ground. As far as they could see, not a single one of them had escaped. You know what that means when I read that? When God says, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to do it halfway. I'm not going to do it sort of. You know, sometimes we pray for healing. Oh, it feels a little better. Listen, my God wants to heal completely, totally, fully, not just a little bit. He did everything he said he'd do. And it says in verse 25, King Jehoshaphat and his men went out to gather the plunder. They found vast amounts of equipment, clothing, and other valuables, more than they could carry. There was also so much plunder that it took them three days just to collect it all. Huh. You set out to destroy me. Now I got your stuff. <laughs> I like that too. Three days ago, we was worried about we were going to get killed. Now I got somebody's belt. I got their clothes. I got their TV. I got this on that car. On the fourth day, they gathered in the Valley of Blessing. On the fourth day, they gathered in the Valley of Blessing. Which got its name that day because the people praised and thanked the Lord there. It is still called the Valley of Blessing today. Listen, I, I, I want to be blessed. Who wants to be blessed? Of course, all of us. Nobody wants to be cursed. Amen? Who want to be blessed? And I can admit that. I want to be blessed. But I realize that I don't just find myself in a blessed place. I have to pray my way into a blessed place. I have to praise my way into a blessed place. The valley of blessing, you know what it is? It's a dwelling place. You know what to dwell means? It means I live there. I live there. You can say this, I dwell in independence. I live in independence. I dwell there. I live there, right? So when we talk about the valley of blessing, it's a dwelling place. That's where I want to dwell. There are all kinds of valleys. When you look at the word of God and I study this, there's all kinds of valleys out there. There's all kinds of valleys. There's valleys, amen, that are pits where Sodom and Gomorrah used to be at. There's all kinds of valleys. But listen, if I'm going to be in a valley, because the Bible talks about peaks and valleys. Valleys, amen, were usually the low places, amen. But I can find myself, amen, in a lower place as long as I'm surrounded by the blessing. I don't have to be in a hill. If God wants to put me in a hill, I can. But listen, I can be in a blessed place no matter where I'm at. I want to reside there. There are, there are valleys all around. There's valley of indecisions. Valley of indecision. Listen, you know what that, that a valley of indecision is a frustrating place to be at. My son Louis, he has a hard time making choices. When we go, we go to the store, I'm like, all right, which candy do you want? He's back and forth. I'm like, come on, man, pick one. He, he like literally like, I don't know. Like, get them both, let's go. I think he does it on purpose. I just got revelation right now. <laughs> Can't wait to get him out of class this morning. You've been getting me all this year. No, no, no. But listen, a valley of indecision is a frustrating place because you don't know whether to go right or left, to go forward or go backward. It's a valley of indecision. That's not where I want to be. I want to be in a valley of blessing. There's also valleys of the shadow of death where everything around me seems scary, where I'm afraid of things that ain't really there. Come on, somebody. There, there's, there's valleys, the Bible calls valleys of Elah, and valleys of Elah are places of war, where I live in a place where it's always conflict. Come on, anybody ever been there? But you know what, sometimes we can go through conflict so much, we start liking it. And when there is a place of peace, we don't know how to deal with it. Come on, it is true. And we, we look for conflict where there ain't no conflict. But for me, I want to dwell in the valley of blessing. Not because I'm trying to get something, but I want to live in it. 
And that's for every one of us this morning. Listen, don't dwell in a place of shadow of death. Don't, don't dwell in a place of indecision or a place of conflict all your life. Listen, you can choose this day to say, you know what? I may have things going on around me. Calamity might be pursuing me, but the battle is not mine. It's God's. And when I understand that, then I can walk in my blessing. See, where the enemy thought he had me is the moment that I begin to, to reap the benefit, the blessing, amen, and begin to get things that I didn't know I would ever get in my life because I'm dwelling in a place of blessing. So I want you to do something for me. I want you to stand on your feet this morning.